when I was on my first placement as a student teacher, I encountered a, uh, a new type of student. Uh, for me, I had never met someone like this. She was very bright, very capable, and she was eager to please. And I thought, you know, this is good. I would say she was too eager to please because she would rush through her work and it would be filled with scribbles and simple mistakes. And she would run up to the teacher and I, I, I'd give some suggestions to improve and she'd run back to her desk and run right back up. She was so motivated to be first in line to get that praise from the teacher that she did not care what her work looked like. The topic I'm here to investigate is student motivation. Not just any student motivation, as I came to realize, but what is, what is positive student motivation in the classroom? When you delve into the literature about motivational psychology, you find out pretty quickly that the community is settled on two sources. Martin Covington, in his article, Intrinsic versus Extrinsic Motivation in Schools, a Reconciliation, puts it very well. Over the past 50 years, two quite different kinds of reasons have emerged in the thinking of psychologists. Intrinsic and extrinsic reasons. Individuals are said to be driven to act for extrinsic reasons when they anticipate some kind of tangible payoff, such as good grades, recognition, or gold stars. These rewards are said to be extrinsic because they are unrelated to the action. In effect, the activity becomes a means to an end. By contrast, individuals are said to be intrinsically motivated when they engage in activities for their own sake. In this instance, the rewards reside in the actions themselves. That is, the actions are their own reinforcement. Let's move from the theoretical to a concrete example. And we'll do that with a name that you cannot avoid when you start delving into motivational psychology. And that name is Edward Deci. In Edward Deci's book, Why We Do What We Do, he talks about a study where he set up a game involving a 3D puzzle. And one of the two groups he tested was given money for their achievements and the other was not. And of course, because this is a psychological study, there's a trick. The real study was watching how people reacted when the half hour of puzzle solving time was over. The experimenter would make an excuse to leave the room and be gone for exactly eight minutes. And this is the time that Deci was interested in. What would the people do? Would they still be interested in the puzzle? The people who had not been given any reward were much more likely to pick up the puzzle and continue playing. And the people who had been paid were more likely to do something else, read a magazine, or just wait. As Deci puts it, stop the pay, stop the play. This is from the chapter, I'm only in it for the money. Introducing monetary rewards seems quickly to have made students dependent on those rewards, shifting their view of the puzzle from a satisfying activity in its own right to an activity that is instrumental for obtaining rewards. Now, I love a good theory. I'm a real sucker for a well-worded abstract concept and I was enjoying my exploration of motivational psychology in the classroom through the literature. And I did find that some of it was offering practical advice for the classroom. We found that students did not typically become disruptive when they were encouraged to talk with one another during lessons. That's from Allison Ryan and Helen Patrick's study of students in grade 8. It's a point that made a deep impact on me. Sometimes that whispering in the back of a class is a student explaining a concept to another student, and the teacher's instinct might be to shut down any noise. But in that case, isn't that the kind of motivated communication we ought to encourage? I mean, what's better than a student trying to help their peer understand the lesson by putting things in their own words? I think I'm biased because I know I did this all the time in class. After all of my reading, I felt I had a good handle on the type of motivated student that I was going to try to create in the classroom. From Martin Covington's article, again, Intrinsic versus Extrinsic Motivation in Schools, a Reconciliation, he suggests three key strategies that also struck a chord with me. 
One, use the student's personal interests, and I think we've been trained to do that in our program so far. Two, remove the feeling of failing as a person by relating a student's accomplishments to goals rather than comparisons with peers. And three, offer rewards that encourage intrinsic motivation. Now that might seem like a paradox, but stay with me on this. For instance, let students share their work and explain themselves, creating opportunities to show how deeply they cared. So the reward is to express their intrinsic motivation. And then my interviews started. Unfortunately, people are a little more complicated than books and all of my conclusions were thrown up in the air. I mean, there were some things that held true. Well, here's a parent talk about her approach to helping her child read. Well, I guess one thing that I'm trying to be really, really careful about is, I guess, giving them praise right where they're at, making them feel like they are accomplishing thing, something every time we do a lesson that they've done really great and that they, yeah, you know, praised for their hard work or, or whatever little thing they've accomplished. And even if Egan writes all his letters backwards from 10 to 1, flipped around the wrong way and in block letters, like it's still great because he's learning to write all his letters and her numbers. And I still tell him he does a great job. And with that mix of helping him learn the right way to do it. Just the respect of where they're at. I like the way she put that, and it's one of the conclusions that I felt I had reached. Stay positive and focus on the successes. I hated school. No motivation, no connection to real life. I want him to realize that even though he hates sitting down for 10 minutes to do his like flashcards for reading time and doing his sight words, it helps him for me to like remind him like, those books that we read together, like you will be able to read them by yourself if we get these down. Like that's the goal we're working towards. And reading and writing, like all the little steps in between, that's his goal, is he'll be able to pick out his own books and read them. So you connect it. For Egan, you connect it to this is going to give you more power, mm -hmm. more independence, mm -hmm. more ability to do what you want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. How does he react to that? He's excited about that. He, like we see, like we we see the, I guess we see what he's hungry for and what he's excited about. Did you notice in that interview how I was trying to push a connection with independence? The other conclusion I had drawn, inspired by Dechi, was the importance of autonomy. Give students the space to be in touch with their own curiosity and give them plenty of options to solve problems in their way. Now, the audio footage from my other interviews is inaudible, but let me summarize the pattern. We would talk about their habits of motivation, and at some point in the interview, I would try to make the connection, force the connection, with positive motivation and autonomy. It was never that simple. I had people who appreciated being forced to do an activity because, in retrospect, they appreciated the skill that it gave them. And what was even more common with a few of my friends who had gone on to grad school was, and, and this was a trend, they identified with really trying to impress teachers. They really liked their teachers and they wanted to be a special student in their eyes. I may have caused them a little embarrassment to admit this, uh, this human desire to be accepted and praised by those we admire. They questioned if it was a healthy motivation, but the fact remains, they're lifelong learners, and the very motivation that I worried about at the beginning of this investigation was part of that. And that's where I'm at now. I recommend Dechi's book, Why We Do What We Do. I think it's a breath of fresh air because he doesn't trap himself into talking about education. He's talking about the bigger picture about fulfilling lives and self-esteem. And he makes a compelling case to respect our right to autonomy. 
on the other hand, isn't part of school to force students to experiment with things that they might not be inclined to try? To hell with their motivation, force them to play different games and praise their successes? Hmm. And I'm going to leave you with this as a reminder that different people are motivated by different things. Okay, dinner time, it's something that they don't want to eat because it has vegetables in it. If we want Fletcher to eat it, um, we'll talk about how old he is and we'll say, okay, look, he's three, so we'll start with three bites and he'll eat it if mommy sits next to him and helps him eat it because he wants to be right by me. So that will be his, will you eat if I help you? Yeah. Okay, I'll help you. Egan. Wait, you could also, you could say to him, here is this cookie sitting on the table. If you eat it, you can have, this cookie. have the cookie as a reward. Fletcher won't eat it. He would choose to be like, no, that's okay, I don't want it. I'm done, and I'm he'll done. leave the table. There's no... <laughs> He wouldn't try for that. So for the prize, no, but for the relationship stuff. Yes. For the approval. Yeah. He'll go the extra mile. Yeah. He'll go the extra broccoli. Yes. yes. But Egan, if he doesn't want to eat something, if you put a cookie in front of Egan, he'll put anything in his mouth. 